you know, I remember in, in 2019, I was in my first year of my PhD program at, at Cambridge, and Jordan Peterson was invited to be a guest research fellow on campus, and then he was disinvited. And, you know, people were cheering and thought this was this great thing. And then I wrote an op-ed challenging the university's decision, and I defended Jordan. And, um, you know, that was that was how I got on his radar um, and how I met Michaela. Was that the university newspaper? Uh, no, this was this was in the New York Times, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I had one contact there who who was subsequently uh, jettisoned after 2020. You know, a lot okay. of things happened in 2020, but he was an editor there. He's no longer there because of 2020. <laughs> Um, wow. But he was a, a sensible person who who uh, allowed that op-ed to be run, um, and you know, so I do things like that, and often would court a little bit of controversy on campus. And there was more than one occasion when a professor would pull me aside uh, when I was still a student and say, like, you know, you got to be careful. You're right on the envelope. I don't know if you want a career in academia or not, but you are sort of pushing things, and if you keep going in this direction, it's going to be hard for you to find a career as a professor, and after enough of those conversations and after seeing enough people get canceled and disinvited and mobbed, I just decided to go like fully independent and um, not pursue that, that career. So I think maybe there is sort of a through line between that sort of young, angry rebelliousness that I had as a kid mm -hmm. to, you know, my willingness to be a little bit more provocative than a lot of other sort of young, aspiring academics. Yes. Screw them. I th I've been thinking more about politeness and what politeness means and, and, and how obviously having a bit of politeness is quite nice and helpful in many situations, but people who are very polite mm -hmm. adhere so stringently to the societal norms of a particular place and time mm -hmm. that they, they're they scary, man. They're mm -hmm. scary, those people. And so you need people like you who are just going to go, Wait, hang on a minute, Wait, hang on, what, what gender did you, did you say that person? Who's going in that toilet or who's, you know, defund the police? Is that a good idea? Um, I was going to say, so your book and your story, mm. it, it, it has echoes of J.D. Vance. Mm. Um, and for those British people might not know, but he's the running mate of Trump now. I think he's sort of, I don't know if he's gone a bit different to how he, he seemed in the book. Anyway, I read his book years ago and he didn't mm. seem like the person I'm seeing now. He seemed a, a little bit more um, centered, is that moderate? I don't know. Mm. Um, but but was he, in his book, in some an inspiration or, or at least like a similar thing? Yeah, I I read, yeah, I read Hillbilly LG, my final year in, in undergrad. And um, I did see sort of traces and echoes of our stories. I know I knew naturally that once my I started writing my book that people were going to draw those parallels. And you know, we both grew up in poverty and various states of chaos. Um, he with his drug addicted mother and her various, um, you know, boyfriends and constantly moving and relocating. Eventually, he did find some stability with his grandparents, with uh, his grandmother in the book, which he describes. But I, I never had that. Mm -hmm. I was just in sort of foster homes and divorces and separations and reunifications and all, you know, all the stuff that I get into in the book. Um, and then from there, he joined the Marines. I joined the Air Force. Then he went off. Well, he went to Ohio State, then Yale Law School, whereas I went to Yale for undergrad and then Cambridge for my PhD. So there's a bit of, you know, that uh, that trajectory, the broad strokes are similar. But, um, you know, one thing that I, I tried to do more in my book, I thought, was, was um, really sort of get into the emotional um, sort of subjective phenomenological state of a child or a teenager in those circumstances. I talk about my friends as well. One thing that I was worried about, because some people did this with JD's book and other books where they thought it was just this conventional bootstraps narrative of, well, here's this kid who had a really tough life and he worked really hard and turned everything around and why can't other people do the same? Whereas with my book, I spent quite a bit of time focusing on the lives and outcomes of the friends that I grew up around and how their lives turned out, because that is the more common expected outcome of someone uh, who grew up in that environment. I had two friends who went to prison. I had one friend who was shot to death and my other friends who were working in kind of various kind of menial physical labor type of jobs, making ends meet, not living especially exciting lives, but they're doing okay. Um, but that is kind of, those are like the options, right? It's like die, like get shot, go to prison or sort of work minimum wage kind of kinds of jobs. Mm -hmm. And then of the six of us, I had five close friends growing up. Of the six of us, I was the only one who went on to university, but that was only after <laughs> joining the military for eight years where I learned how to actually become a self-sufficient adult. If I had gone on straight out of high school to university, I know that I would have failed out or potentially done something harmful to myself or to others. Um, 
Now, all this being said, JD was was really helpful to me when I was writing my book. Um, I had a couple of conversations with him. He gave me some good writing advice, and um, you know, yeah, he. I think his book did sort of maybe pave the way, indicating that there is an audience for this kind of story. Hmm. What do your old friends think of you now? Um, you know, we don't talk that much about it. You know, every once in a while, one of them will text me, some friend from high school, and I'll say, hey, like you popped up on the YouTube algorithm on Jordan Peterson or something like that. And they'll say it's cool, but I I don't like, you know, I'll say, hey, that, that was cool that you saw that, but I try not to dwell on it too much just because I don't want to underscore just how differently our lives have gone. Um, I could imagine being in their position and and not really... You know, I think it would be hard to be friends with someone who's doing so much better than you and then reminds you of it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one thing you can be friends with someone and you sort of focus on commonality, shared histories. But when someone is constantly um, doing, you know, doing things that uh, are unexpected, it can be it can be hard to maintain a friendship that way. They must think you're a snob or something. I, yeah, I mean, yeah. they probably do anyway at this yeah. point. I got friends, but I, I don't want to. I don't want to fuel it. You know, <laughs> my my best friend who did his did my wedding speech, uh, the, the best man speech at my wedding. He he got my he came up on not stage but in front of everyone and uh, opened my book, which I just you know the which mm. is nothing to do, and he pretended to read from it, and it was just he read out like the most uh, arrogant stuff, just like I went down to spend time with these little people over there, <laughs> and people were just cracking up, and I could tell That's in great. that laughter it was like. Finally, we got him because yeah. they think I'm a snob or something, which I don't think I act like at all. But yeah. um, obviously, I had to do a big fake smile for about an hour. Yeah, uh, yeah. but <laughs> uncomfortable. Yeah, but those are those friends. Um, what about onto university? Then having a completely different background, sharing dorms. This is Cambridge, uh, sharing classrooms. People who 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 have their own luxury beliefs. Yeah. Well. Uh, my, my 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 initial transition, so I, I left high school, I graduated at age 17, and then I joined the U.S. Air Force, mm. 17 to 25. And that's another, you know, you mentioned earlier just how different I am. Part of it was just because I spent eight years in the military, and that will change anyone. Mm. Um, and so by the time I was 25, then I went to Yale for undergrad, and that was when I first encountered people with luxury beliefs. Um, you know, I cite statistics in the book indicating that there are more students at Yale more students from families in the top 1% of the income scale than the entire bottom 60%. Mm -hmm. It's just a massive uh, dramatic change in terms of, you know, students who went to private boarding schools and, you know, had never once worried about money their whole lives. Um, and so I was, I, I entered campus sort of prepared for that, that I knew, you know, it's kind of a famous university. It's famous for students who are smart and rich and so on. I was not prepared to learn just how different, um, you know, the sort of social and family factors would be. I talk about how in, in, in the book, I was in a classroom and the professor administered this anonymous survey to the class. And the question was, uh, were you raised by both of your birth parents? Um, and then the professor put the anonymous results up on a PowerPoint slide, and I was just shocked to find that it was something like 90% of the class had been raised by both of their birth parents. Because you know, I don't know what I would have guessed in advance, maybe 50%, 60%, because of the way that I had grown up. I'd, you know, I'd known so many families that had been in various states of fragmentation and disarray. And then I would speak with students and, you know, repeatedly, yeah, they were raised in a very sort of conventional, you know, bourgeois uh, family. Um, and yet that was the first time that I had ever heard people champion this view that marriage was outdated, ah, okay. family, we should abandon the, these old concepts of the family. Um, every family structure is the same. Uh, monogamy is this oppressive concept. And so it was the people who were the most likely to benefit from marriage and monogamy and commitment in these old family structures who were championing this view that we should uh, abandon those ideas. And more than once I had a conversation with a student who, you know, they would say that monogamy was outdated, marriage is this oppressive force. I would ask them, well, how were you raised mm -hmm. in your life? And they would say, oh, I was raised by two married parents. And then I would ask them, you know, if if you had planned to have a family, how would you raise your children? What kind of family structure would you want to have? 
And they would always say, oh, you know, I was raised this way with my, my mom and my dad and this family structure, and I'll probably do it for myself. But we do need to rethink how family uh, is considered in society. Maybe we need to abandon it or we need to um, evolve beyond it. And what I was hearing from these students, and you, know, you, you hear this from young, young graduates as well, that what I was hearing was I personally benefited from this age-old structure that allowed me to study at a place like Yale, and I plan to carry those benefits forward for my own children. But my official public stance is that people shouldn't <laughs> do this. Like, don't do this thing that could potentially help um, you and your kids and achieve some upward mobility for your family. And you know, I couldn't help but notice that that du duplicity. And at that at that time, I was also reading a lot of old school sociology and psychology papers, and sort of slowly assembling this idea of luxury beliefs. But it did start with those kinds of interactions repeatedly. Students who had every possible advantage. Uh, and yet they were attempting to denigrate and er erode the very attributes and habits that fueled their own success. That's really interesting. 